Hello everyone, you are listening to She Leads with Carly, and in this show, we talk to the absolute best, brightest, and yes, badass leaders. I'm your host, Carly Malatsky. Hello everyone, I am super excited to welcome our guest today, Holly Liu. Holly is the co-founder of Kabam, a mobile gaming company that sold for approximately $1 billion to Netmarble in 2017. They grew Kabam to over 1,500 employees with six offices worldwide. Prior to Kabam, Holly graduated from UCLA with a degree in communications and East Asian studies and received her master's from Berkeley in information management and systems. She started her professional career in consulting and working as a user interface designer at AOL. Throughout her 10-year tenure as a co-founder of Kabam, Holly led efforts in a variety of roles, including user experience, HR, development, and people. Her work has contributed to record revenue growth for Kabam year over year from zero to $400 million annually that led Kabam into the Unicorn Club in 2014. She then led the design for Kabam's award-winning Kingdoms of Camelot franchise, which has grossed over $250 million in less than four years, and the extension game, which was the top grossing app on iOS in 2012. Post-Kabam, Holly transitioned to the other side of the table as an investor. She spent two years as a visiting partner at Y Combinator, the leading startup accelerator for entrepreneurs. She is a consummate entrepreneur, executive, and startup mentor. Naturally, Holly has been a leading woman in gaming and entrepreneurship, named by Fortune as the 10 most powerful women in gaming. Holly, it is such an honor to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Of course. Okay. I am so excited. We have so much to cover. But first, Holly, what I like to do, as you know, is I want to know five-year-old, 10-year-old Holly, who were you as a kid? Where did you grow up to? Uh, (laughs) So I grew up in a very small town right outside of the, like on the edge of LA County. It was called Palmdale, Lancaster in the Mojave Desert area. Uh, I was probably the only Asian. My parents are immigrants uh, from, they're originally from China via Taiwan. They came to the U.S. for their master's degree. They actually ended up in Oregon for their master's at OSU. And uh, my mom became a special ed teacher, a resource teacher. And it's so funny because it was such a different time that they just kept on driving south looking for jobs. There was no answering machine at the time. There was no like call waiting. Yeah. I don't even know if people know what answer. There's no voice, voicemail. Sorry, people. <laughs> There's no voicemail. There was this, yeah, I guess people have call waiting still. So they at that time, you literally have to just see what's in it. This thing called a newspaper, which a lot of people don't have these days and see, oh, like they call them want ads, like we're want a teacher. We want this. And you would march in your resume. And uh, they just kept driving further and further south. And that was the first a job opportunity that actually my mom had. Uh, my dad uh, studied uh, statistics and history. Yeah, statistics and history. And he later became a math teacher, but originally he was doing, um, actually, I found out he was doing a business called Fun Store. So it was like the 99 cent wow. store at the time. So it might play into some of the things um, in terms of how it kind of formed me, but I had no idea he had done that be- until like, after I was born, he took a more stable yeah. job, which is teaching. But I, I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense now once I found You see, out. like, a little bit of that influence <laughs> start to trickle in, in a sense. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Calling it the fun store and everything. That's amazing. So. And Holly, do you, have, did you, do you have siblings? I do. So I have one older sibling. I'm, I'm the youngest of two. Um, we're a couple years apart. Um, and, yeah, I pretty much grew up in that town. It was a very typical if you watch Stranger Things, a TV show, it's typically that. That, that, that. That's what it was like, the technology at the time and everything. Um, and just not as many Asians there. So um, not as much representation. And that definitely influenced a bit of um, who I yeah. am today and a lot of just um, my perspective on, yeah. things, on, on different And we'll, we'll get to that, right? But even just, I feel like you, yeah. you gain this comfort in being you know, the only one, whether it's women in gaming or whatnot. So, so we'll talk about that, but <laughs> it's a good point. I don't know if I ever got comfortable, but it just happened. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> it's but point. Holly, I want to know, were you, when did the passion for gaming start? Obviously, you know, it's been such a big part of your life and how yeah. is it for you at a, at a young age? So it's pretty interesting. I think, um, 
it's funny because if you think about video games, they didn't come out till I want to say, I just remember this. My dad was it, it, till the mid eighties. And my dad's like, Oh, if it drops to like $50, we'll get you an Atari. Atari was the first one, but we, um, computers also came out when I was growing up. Yes. <laughs> I grew up a decade, several decades before. Um, and, um, I just remember us crowding around the PC because at the time, that's it. You crowd around the TV. There's only like one screen <laughs> to crowd around. And um, there was um, a couple of games we'd love to play, which was uh, there was one that was very simple called Brick Breaker. And you just move the cursor back and forth. And there was a ball that would just bounce up and off and you try to catch it. Obviously, Frogger, which was um, just one of our favorites. Um, Decathlon, uh, which was like you would run and you would jump. It was one of those runner games. And then there was a shooting one called Buck Rogers. So in terms of like video games, that's what we started with. That's what we had. It was on the PC. But non-video games, I'll, I will throw just general games in there because I, I certainly, and we can dig into this about um, why are there more men in gaming versus women um, and just things that have happened there is, you know, I, I, there's also for me growing up, there was a lot of like offline play. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we there's so much that people lament about these days where there's less unorganized play. Absolutely. There was a bunch of games that we played unorganized and unchaperoned that maybe we shouldn't have played. I don't know. There, there was one game we called Butts Up, right? You could like basically, <laughs> I know. Would, I, know I, I don't know if people would like, I don't know if kids still play this, but it's pretty mean. There's a lot of mean stuff that they do, but like pretty much you have to like get to the garage before yeah. like the ball bounces or else growing, they get growing up something with soccer, behind, I, I right? played butts up. I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> about. Oh, okay. You know what you're talking about. Okay. I was like, oh, is it still around? I'm like, okay, I got, I got to get my kids out there and play. So, um, so yeah, I, I think like, um, absolutely. I think, um, you know, later when we talk about just that disparity, there's also something inside of me that's always like play has always been <clears throat> a human condition. It's not gendered at all in many ways. And so I certainly think as you've kind of grow up in the video game space, there are a lot of things there that kind of do not make it easy to enter in. And mine was a very unconventional path for me and my co-founders. And, and we could just certainly talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Very unconventional. And so, <laughs> so it wasn't like, I know some people are like, they were dying and I would never have expected this is an industry that I would go into, end up influencing a lot and changing. And But Holly, tell me this, when you were growing up playing games, I imagine it was, it was very much a passion rather than this is something I want to go into and, you know, make money from. Were you thinking about it in that lens or more so this yeah. is a passion. Let me go to school and get my studies and then and then start a career. Oh, yeah. I have Asian yeah. parents. <laughs> There's no way I could do art or like anything of that sort. I, I actually never, never uh, wanted to be like a video game maker. I wouldn't even call myself a gamer quite okay. frankly. And we can get into that later. But um, certainly had a ton of like and I don't know if it's a lost art, but just a ton of memories of just doing a ton of projects with with people, with the, the neighborhood kids. We like would have a coli sack newsletter that we would put out, you know, just little things that seem very silly. Um, playing like teacher or play like some of the imaginary play that ended up way into like when you're like 10 and much yeah. later. Um, a lot of projects around like making things and selling them or like just making things like we used to have a discarded pile of wood and my next door neighbor, her dad was a carpenter and she saw the wood and she's like, oh, let's do things together. So we were like, I don't know, we were doing weird stuff with like stool. Like this is before there was like a big maker space. Yeah. Like my parents were just like, go figure it out. So I certainly think like in terms of that, it like it, it never dawned. Like I would probably say the first occupation I wanted to be was a TV cameraman or camera woman. I don't know why. I thought that was the coolest yeah. thing. And then that ended up drifting away. I was like, maybe I want to be an architect. And then I saw how difficult like and competitive it was. And I was like, <laughs> okay, not quite, not quite. It's okay. So um, certainly I think like um, there are certain kids that are um, have a certain like, I've wanted to be a pilot ever since I was 10. Not quite that person. And in some ways, that's okay too, I think, because it offers you a lot of flexibility to kind of just even discover your hobbies, which you enjoy and gives you time to really be a kid and really play. And that's like a big 
human condition yeah. and it's also i guess my theory around absolutely <laughs> and i think and i think your childhood just reflecting on it it sounds like play at, in any realm was at its core right whether it's outside whether it's acting like a teacher and and things like that i think it came up which oh, yeah. is which is great but yeah yeah i i would think so I, I i think about it now like i have kids and i'm raising them and i'm like they, they joke around they're always like holly or not holly they're like mommy did you did you have us just so you could do kid stuff? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> like, of course, I want to go in the jumpy house. I didn't have this as a kid. This is oh, awesome. I love that. You know, and so I think there is probably a lot of things that you end up trying to like recreate or redo or even make up for um, when you do have children. Absolutely. <laughs> My and kids. I love that. But yes, I think play is very important and so, with kids. <laughs> Holly, ultimately, like I said in the intro, you go study at UCLA in communications and East Asian studies. Yeah. And I've learned that you were gravitated towards government and even working for the American embassy oh, yes. in Ireland. So what? Yes. What? yes. What? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's in your work. I'm impressed. So walk yes. me through that journey and, and what gravitated yeah. you towards that and how you were thinking yeah. through it. It's so funny. Um, it's interesting, yeah, because I, I never had one, like, I've always wanted to be to this since I was 10. And it's funny because I tell a lot of, I, I tell a lot of people I love college. I loved it so much. It's probably why I picked up all these, like, majors and things like that. And I'm always like, yeah, you can figure out what you want, don't like. I go always pick up internships because you can at least figure out what you don't like. And then, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so a huge fan of um, trying a ton of things out. And um, I was very, very interested in Asia in particular. Um, I think the influence, quite frankly, of not having a lot of Asians around was almost like at school, I was rediscovering a lot of my heritage. Uh, there were certain things that I didn't grow up that my other Chinese American friends grew up with, like they had to go to Chinese school every yeah. week, but there just wasn't enough of us to even do that. So I'm like, oh, I didn't even know. And what was really funny is uh, I started taking um, Chinese language classes. So if you ever take a language class in college, it's the 8 a.m. class. It's usually five days a week, right? And it's just kind of intensive. You have to do it every day. It, like You can't bulk it up. And then soon I just found myself taking three years of Chinese. And I'm like, well, I got it. I have to have it count for right. something. And I was always really interested in like particularly China's history and its, its – um, how it like uh, society, culture, all of those things. Cause I was learning so much about myself, learning about the events that impacted my parents. Cause again, I didn't, I didn't know any of that stuff in college or in high school. It, I just wasn't as exposed to it. And so um, that's how I ended up doing East Asian studies. And I was very interested in going into um, going into the foreign service. And so I started, pay, I did my first internship at um, this, the State Department at the Foreign Service Institute. So that was the place where they trained people to go out there. And so I got to learn what it was like to be a foreign, like what was this whole like, the State Department about? And i be honest, I was incredibly spoiled because, um, so basically it's an institute. Um, a lot of people had did briefing reports on like different countries. You gotta meet a lot of students from all over the US and incredibly bright um, folks, but I was incredibly spoiled because um, the, the professor that was at the Institute who could choose, she was like, oh, I have two interns to choose. She's like, I actually wanted you in particular because you have a communication slash, it's almost like a media yeah. degree as well as the East Asian studies degree. And my whole job there was to watch, uh, I did, they called it the first annotated videography, but it was like, all I did was watch movies <laughs> that whole summer and I got to use everything um, that I learned from like Chinese history. So uh, this was, well, I guess you still timestamp things. So I timestamp it and I'd be like, this is the political context, the cultural context and the economic context. So then when anybody would watch that film, they could, they could know like at this scene why they're doing this or what's happening there just to give that context. So of course I'm like, this is amazing. Is this what I would get to do as like the state department? And then I found out like, oh, as a foreign service officer, you can travel. And um, I think that's one of the things my, my, my father really loved to travel. So um, he's like, I want to see the whole world before my legs like give out. So once like 
travel was a lot easier. He did it more and more and more, but he always just loved that. And I was like, oh, well, I should go try to see what an embassy is like. And so it was kind of funny. It's, it's a bit of a hack, yeah. actually. So now everybody will know if they're interested in trying to work at an, at an embassy or get an internship out there, that how I hacked it was um, I was, remember I told you how much I loved college and I loved school so much. I just stayed a little bit longer. I ended up graduating during like an off quarter. Okay. Um, we we're on the quarter system. And so I was like, well, I should just apply during then because the, the competition yeah. would be a lot lower. Um, I don't know how I ended up choosing Ireland. I, I think it was just, oh, I think there was no openings for the, the East Asia Bureau. And it also started feeling like, I mean, that's where I got to learn a lot about going into foreign service work and the government is great. Um, there, there's just all these yeah. things that are really wonderful, but I also realized it just probably wasn't a path for me. It didn't move as fast as I'd like to. Um, at the time too, um, the internet was just booming. So there were oftentimes like, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this here, but I, I, I had like, you know, a classified level of, you know, clearance and they're like, Oh, here's the cables, Holly. And I'm like, I just read that in the paper this morning. So some of it I was like, say that classified. <laughs> and then it was also like a different time too, because the way the technology was, definitely there was the internet, but it was like there was disks and everything. So I remember the political economic officer was like, he would unlock, he would pull out, he would call it the brain of the computer, but he would remove the hard drive, lock it up at night, and then unlock it. And I get it. Like everything had protocol. But I, I also remember this where I was like, I don't know if this is if, if I could handle much of this <laughs> is um, the person that was supposed to take my photo for an ID badge was out on the holiday over there for like two weeks. So, so I just, so I think wait. like, you know right. what I mean? Like I was like, it was a little too slow for me. I, it just wasn't my cup of tea. And then you didn't have any choice on where you could. So you really it seems didn't. like from there. And one thing I'm actually curious about, even before we get into, you know, that real big shift into consulting, technology, AOL, and then obviously Kabam, mm -hmm. I want to know, Holly, from a personal standpoint, did you start to find peace with your, your, your Asian identity, that side to it? Because being the only one and then learning the history of it, like, was there almost a personal, you know, transformation that happened? You know, it's kind of funny. I think it's a journey that still is, yeah. is... I'm still on it in many ways, um, but absolutely going to UCLA was like a, a big jump and staying there. Uh, UCLA, if you don't know, has a lot they of They do, patients. yes. <laughs> Just FYI. So a lot of people look like me and it was it was literally culture shock for me in many yeah. ways. And um, kind of learning a bit more. Uh, and it's kind of funny because it is this journey. And this is actually really funny. I, I was telling somebody this the other day. I was like, growing up, I actually thought Chinese American when people would ask me what I was, because I got that question a lot growing up, I'd always say I'm Chinese because obviously they can't figure it out or so they'd ask. Right. <laughs> I was like, maybe they think I'm white or something. So I'm like, Chinese. and for the longest time I thought Chinese American meant you're half Chinese and half white. Oh. I didn't quite realize. And even when I decided to study, I never studied Asian American studies or Asian American right. history. I studied Chinese history. And um, I, um, you know, we could talk about more of this later, but the reason why it's been a journey is that I've taken several trips to China. I still have grandparents and um, I have relatives there. Well, I don't have grandparents anymore over there, but uh, I've had relatives there and we've, I've gone back over time. Even Kabam opened up an yeah. office in China. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it's, it's still been a journey because I, I, it wasn't till probably a couple years ago when I was there, I was like, wow, I might feel Chinese on the inside, but I'm not Chinese. Huh. Like they look at me as American. And so yeah. in some ways it's everything is, it, it's certainly like helped me become more and more comfortable yeah. as, you know, definitely as you get older, you're just like, I don't know, this is a, this is it. This is all yeah, I can do. But <laughs> I think, I, <laughs> you're I like, think, okay. but there were certain parts in my head where I'm like, I mean, ah, that's so, okay. it's like, so interesting though, because I think a lot, a lot of people deal with this, right. Where they, could feel, you know, inside, mm. this is who they are as, you know, as a person in their identity, but on the outside, you know, they feel that they're yeah. an outsider or, you know, they're, they're a foreigner. So it's like, oh, at what absolutely. point can I fit in? Can I ever fit in? So anyway, that that's amazing. Yeah. And I'm sure it's, it, it's a, it is a journey, like you said. 
Oh, I'm still Absolutely. dealing with it. And I'm well into yeah. adulthood and they just, the universe decided to give me kids. I'm like, okay. And so now it passes on to them. <laughs> oh no, now I'm passing it on. So, so Holly, after, once you made that, that realization that, you know what, foreign services, it's, a, it's too slow for me. And I need, I need faster, especially yeah. with the internet coming. Walk me through that next journey of, you know, going into consulting sure. and then just finding this whole new wave. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So not only did government where I was like, okay, this probably isn't for me, but I also needed a job. And the nice thing is before I ended up going, it's almost like a secured gap year is what I ended up doing as part of it is um, before I left, I, I got a job at Arthur Anderson. Probably a lot of people don't know who they are right now, but they used to be one of the largest accounting firms um, and Accenture kind of spun out of them eventually. Probably a lot of people yeah. heard of them. It was it was like the dot com boom. There was SAP implementations, Oracle, fancy fancy, um, and so I I ended up taking the opportunity to just travel some more. So I was very fortunate on that, and um, I think what had ended up happening. Well, not that I think what ended up happening was dot com boom, and then it busted. <laughs> They called me up and they're like, we need to move your, your date back. Like in the fall, they needed to keep moving it further back. And finally they said, you know, we had to cut some jobs. And um, so you're going to have to come back. If you want to work with us, you're just going to have to come back and interview somewhere else. So um, I ended up working there for about 18 months and uh, realized pretty quickly, like three or four months in, I was like, this is, this is not me. Yeah. <laughs> I have like, it's interesting, uh, but it wasn't for me. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I think I'm a little bit too uh, uh, creative or I wouldn't call it creative, but some people were just amazing at cleaning up these spreadsheets. They were amazing at doing all these things. I just probably knew I wasn't, I wasn't the right fit. And uh, the funniest thing, I just remember this because it had a lot of, um, we had a lot of traveling that was happening. And they would send me out to like sometimes chemical plants to audit things, to look at their processes. And sometimes, you know, you're like super, you're young and you're like, I don't have any family. So yeah, I'll stay out here and I'll spend some time on the weekend. So one time I just stayed out for like three weeks um, in Houston or something. And I was like, yeah, sure. So we're coming back. And I remember this because uh, I had a coworker that was like up towards the front and we're coming back on LAX and the plane starts pitching. Like it, I could see the lights, like the street lamp lights on yeah. LAX. So we're coming in and the plane starts pitching back and forth at like a 45 degree angle. And like, it's like initially in the, 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 the plane starts shaking and you're just like, Oh, oh no. my God. Oh no. Right. Like it's just like the movies, right. Where people start screaming. They're like, what's going on. There was a 75 year old dude next to me who was so scared. He wanted to hold my oh, hand. My. I'm like, I don't know if I could do anything. And I just remember praying. I was like, Oh, I, and just thinking, I was like, oh my gosh, God, I cannot believe that I am going to die for a job I wasn't crazy about and three weeks of dirty laundry. Like, I'm like, I don't know. I was like, and then that's when I decided to go home and I was like, I am going to apply for what I originally wanted to do was to basically computer. It's like, I, I wanted to get into, right. you know, like, I don't know, coding, scripting, whatever. Back then it was seen as coding, but now not really. So I applied to, um, Actually, I think I only ended up, maybe I applied to two schools. It was um, Berkeley's Information Management and yeah. Systems. It was their old library science. There was a lot of like, I felt like, yeah, there's just more information. Of course, you want to figure out how to organize it, how to retrieve it. This was probably maybe two, like maybe the year Google might have been formed. I can't remember what year that Google was formed, but I do remember that they came and recruited on our campus, like, it's like this guy, Larry Page. It's just, I was like, whoa, Casual. okay. But he wasn't like, you just didn't even know at that yeah. time, right? They were just recruiting students and stuff. And um, so, so, so you need, yeah. it's, it's funny now, you know, thankfully all is safe and well and everything, but it's funny that you needed that, oh, that yeah. you know, oh shit moment some to, push. yeah, some yeah, push to like yeah. kind of put you into that next gear of saying, you know what? I'm actually not passionate about this and I need to be doing something else. So, so eventually yeah. when did you make it your way to, consulting because obviously looking back it was such a oh, special yeah. time you ultimately met one of your co-founders for kabam that's right that's right um so it's kind of funny i ended up um studying information management systems i actually fell in love 
even more so with just the tech industry up here. I fell in love with the particular discipline of human computing interaction. I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to design, I want to do product designs for software. I loved it. I loved how um, people could have a say in the story yeah. and the whole experience. And there was no jobs when I graduated. <laughs> so I actually just went back. And was, I was like, I can't believe I want to say this on a podcast, but I went back and I was even making less than like when I left my entry level yeah. job, it was just that bad. And all these companies, these tech companies were just going under left and right. So that's how I ended up in consulting. And um, I'm a huge fan of like, I would say two, two out of the four founders I met through work. And I, I think I'm a, I'm a huge fan. If you're like working somewhere, you're thinking about it, you should just talk to other co-founders, do some stuff, some projects on the side, because you get to see how you work together. Yeah. Um, and um, this, this one, we weren't, we were at the same client site. He was doing a little bit of a different of a project. And I'm like, you know, you're leaving every day at a certain time on Friday and you look more dressed up. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, well, I'm doing this startup and we're pitching VCs and I'm like, Ooh, can I help? Like, do you need any like design help? He's like, sure. And we just kind of became friends in the process and his startup didn't really go anywhere, but he ended up joining us when we were, I remember I was talking to my net, the, who became the CEO and as well as co-founder. So we grew, we grew up together. We're actually cousins. Wow. Um, the CEO of, yeah. So, so I remember when I was at AOL, I was like, I think it's time to go. And, but I don't know anything about a business. As you can tell, I might be a little bit more on the creative side of things. And I remember like pitching him. I'm like, I had this little like bug, bug book almost of like, I don't know, things that like could be designed better. Some, I think it was somebody at IDEO who said this. It's like, I'll have a design bug book. And I go, oh, that's a great idea. So it'd be things like, I don't know, um, like uh, stain proof, like shirts. So when you yeah. eat spaghetti, it doesn't splatter. Things that are dumb, like- Or you even or had like, a you even uh, had a mouse, right? A mouse that attached to- Oh yeah, yeah, a mouse house. That's what I call it. It would attach to the back of my laptop because the problem was is like when I was at AOL, you would just run around with all these meetings. And when you're a designer, the mouse was incredibly important because you're going across the entire canvas and it was just so annoying all the time. So this thing like a mouse house, then I stuck it on a turntable so I could turn it around. I mean, it was, we had a lot of like lame stuff, but it was really fun. Like I, I would say the design so, at, at AOL was really, really so fun. So like um, you said, right, is yeah. the importance of working together as a co-founding team. I want to yeah. now know, take me into that time where you developed the water cooler, right? The first iteration yeah. of the company. Yeah. And I want to yeah. go a little bit through those big pivots that you had. But first, take me through that initial yeah. point where yeah. you're like, you guys, there's something sure. special here. We should start a, a we should start a company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't know, but um, Kabam didn't start out as a mobile gaming company. In fact, the mobile phone wasn't even launched uh, when we started. So when we started, it was a corporate social network. I think you might've just fell asleep. Um, as I said, those three words, but like basically we were uh, the four of us. Um, so it was kind of funny where we're like, I remember this, uh, the CEO was like, Holly, these are all great ideas, but we need somebody who can build it. And I'm like, oh, I know just the guy. So I pulled the guy from that I met at Accenture and then he goes, oh, Holly, these are all great ideas, but um, like I need like I need the I need a front end guy to go. Oh, I know just the guy I'd work with him at yeah. AOL and we had been doing projects together. So the four of us kind of got together and we started talking about different ideas. Um, and the greatest thing is our, our CEO had worked as a VC. He was also an investment banker. So he thought a lot about market and business. And kind of the idea of like, you know, at one point in the company, we were scrapping everything and we were trying to come up with different ideas. And of course, everyone always comes up with food and dating. And he was always like, well, the problem with dating is there's no exit opportunities. Like, who are you, who's going to buy it? Or even he didn't say, well, even this part of like, if you're successful off of these dating sites, mm. you leave. And so there's not this long term right. kind of benefit that that benefits the business and benefits your customers. Because it was right? it was also at the time long -term around 2006. It wasn't also at the time where Facebook, you know, they've they've gone in some social yes. network, but again to like poor college students and they couldn't really pay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that's exactly what we're thinking. We raised on the idea of a corporate social network because we're like, 
Oh, these crazy people at Facebook, they going after people who are poor, time rich, but poor. But we know people who are like rich, you know, these young professionals. So we're like, what if we were to lasso it like, it's almost like we created an intranet, really. We lassoed it by their um, the company domain and we're like, okay, this should kind of help. Well, after eight months, we had about 1,400 registered users, uh, five DAUs, which is probably our moms, <laughs> right? And I'd say like 20 cease and desist letters from, our, from lawyers saying like, hey, you can't just email people directly like this. This has to become sanctioned. And we took a hard look at ourselves and we said, do we really want to... Um, you know, do we want to build a B2B business where it all came from what we call B2C? Yeah. Um, that was our background. That's what we knew a bit more. Uh, we were younger too. So it's not like we had all the connections and we were, I mean, this had to play into it. We were an all Asian team as well. So it's, I think traditionally HR B2B SaaS is usually if you're a bit more experienced, not more on the Caucasian side and male. Yeah. It's a little easier because yeah. you just call up your contacts and say like, who did the, like, you know, Hey, I got this new thing to sell you. And blah, right. Blah, like blah, there blah. were external so we're like, do, factors do we really want coming to into it that like you couldn't even bit. put in your control. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And we were, we were even at the time. So even fundraising at the time was so different. And at the end of the day, it was the VC firm that um, I, I joke around. I'm like, they took pity on us and gave us like 500K. Yeah. And we were, I remember our CEO was like, this is great. It's in a form of a convertible note. We're like, yeah, <laughs> we don't even have that anymore. It's like, they loan you the money in exchange. We give them stock. We don't have to do a price round. We're like, okay, <laughs> like we were just so green. And like YC didn't exist. Like there was no such thing as an angel, right? Because people hadn't quite fully exited yet. and. Um, the internet was still, you know, growing. Um, and so it, it just was a lot harder to kind of figure, figure that out. So I, I joke around, she took pity on us and invested in us, but, um, it paid yeah. off in many ways. And, <laughs> and we were thinking about returning the money after 500. We're like, well, maybe we'll just return what we have. So um, and she was like, you know what? It's not even worth the tax credit. So, <laughs> that's when so you know. It was. So, so tell me, what did that yeah. look like from there to Kabam, right? Because I know at one point it was yeah. like that mm -hmm. Series B funding and Lehman Brothers crash. Like oh, there was yeah, a lot that yeah. happened. Oh yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Gap. A lot. So it's it's a running joke in that like we've did like three companies. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I was like, yeah, within one. So we pivoted. So right when, when she was like, yeah, don't, it's not even worth the tax write off. It's fine guys. And so we're like, okay, what do we do? And uh, we had a product manager at the time who was uh, like, his hobby was to write about Facebook, this new thing that was coming out. That was the reason why we hired him. Cause we're like, Hey, we're building Facebook, but for corporations. And um, he said, hey, guys, there's this thing called an app developer network that they, they decided to do. So this is like super old school, <laughs> a long time ago. But Facebook was incredibly smart. They basically opened up a developer platform for, for, de for obviously developers. And they said, hey, come build your app here. We have obviously the distribution, the platform, the network. You can make basically features for us. And feel free to also monetize, right? It was like such a win-win because they got expanded on features. Of course, there were a lot of apps. So this is during the time of like plants, not, not plants, as, uh, zombies versus right. vampires, super poke. Um, Zynga was um, doing poker at the time. Farmville hadn't come out. So we ended up, um, it's funny. I remember we came in on a Saturday and we were doing like a huge brainstorm of like, man, the the way the platform was growing was just nuts. Okay. Like nobody had ever seen anything like it. Like it was growing like millions over the weekend. Like I, I still don't maybe, yeah, ChatGPT is probably like the closest yeah. or the mobile phone adoption. But even that took years over. It was just Facebook was nuts, uh, I would say, on installs, app installs. Um, and so we were looking at that and saying like, what can we build? But so Holly, one thing that I think – you know, it sounds like it makes sense, right? Given where you got to. But one thing I'm wondering about is yeah. like going from B2B to gaming is so different. And, you know, naturally I gaming know. sounds like you need, yes. you need those type of people mm -hmm. with experience and that expertise. But how were you guys, did anyone be like, guys, <laughs> quite, we're not, not, quite, we're yeah. not gamers? So how did you think through that? It's funny. 
Of course, of course, we're like, so um, it's a confluence of things. So uh, we didn't jump from B2B to games, but what we ended up building on Facebook was um, a, um, a, a basically a community apps for TV shows Got it. and uh, sports okay. fans. So that started us looking a lot at community. Uh, we, we grew that to probably a 60 million registered users. Um, it was, it was crazy. Like ABC wanted to distribute video on our applications, not Facebook because it ju they just didn't have the fans at the time. And now there was fan, then that turned into fan pages and groups. But what was very interesting is during that time, a whole new uh, world of games came out, Farmville, Cityville, Mafia Wars, and there was a whole new business model that was quite different, that was very open to people who were like us, which we, we call web-based background. So if you look at the game developers at that time, the Zingas, yeah. um, there was one called Kixai. Um, there was other contemporaries like a Storm 8. There was a Crowdstar. Um, you know, all of them had a new business model, which was called free to play. And, or you can call it microtransactions. So it was very different than game, the traditional games where you buy a console, you unwrap it, and you cannot return it. That's like the movie industry. You buy a ticket. If you don't like it, you can't return it. Whereas with this new business model, you had to think a lot more long term. You had to, we call it live operations. Once a game launches, like once you have a pilot episode of a TV show, you can't not do right. anything. That's why sometimes they write out ahead of time. They think about the arc of the character. Yeah. They think a bit more about, so, so the care, like the way the games are even developed are very different and it played to our advantage of not being game designers actually. Wow. And so if you look at the people at the time, League of Legends is one of the largest esports games. They weren't on Facebook, but they are consultants, mm -hmm. Zynga's consultants. Oh, Our background is consultants, uh, and we were all web. Yeah, we're all web. And the thing is, is the problem with like if you make a movie or anything where you, you have to package it up and ship it, everything has to be perfect, right? But we were launching stuff that wasn't even done wow. yet. And we're like, that's okay, we'll patch a fix. Because you can, that's how the web work, world works. It's very iterative. Now, there's definitely, definitely some parts of like game design that you cannot do that. That's the one thing I learned is like, Game design is a lot more in terms of like a core loop, and then you expand out of that. No different than some things that you do on products, yeah. productivity products like your email. There's a core loop, and then there's extra features on top of that. But um, this one, ha you know, you'd have questing your games. So um, we decided to go into games. Um, you had mentioned a little bit of our, our Series B, and um, that was before we went into games. And the cause of why we decided to go into games our series, you know, we were growing our, our community, our, our community kind of apps and they were growing at a good clip, but Facebook was changing things. But the biggest impact was the 2008 recession. We started fundraising in May, closed term sheets like a couple months later. And the day that Lehman Brothers uh, fell to a dollar was the same day that the VC was supposed to wire oh the money God. and the money never came in. And finally, after a week of calling them, they said, we're very sorry. We cannot do this. Like, this is this is not good. There's so much macro. And it's kind of funny now being on the investor side and seeing the pullback. Yeah. And like, I get it. Like, and they shouldn't have done that. And that started probably particularly for our CEO, like one of the worst fundraisers ever um, with 18 months. And we pretty much had a cut. So it's, it didn't even just impact our fundraise. What it also impacted was we were ad supported business, the community apps. So we saw $3 million contracts disappear all overnight. We saw like wow. the payouts for, you know, our ad impressions drop to like, I don't know, less than pennies. It was did just you terrible. Have, and so there was a lot. you have to do a lot of layoffs we about like from the team or how did that change? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we're about 30 people at the time. It was also pre pandemic. So I, I can't even imagine what these CEOs have had to go through. Um, during the pandemic and doing everything remote because there was something really nice about everybody in the same room, like kind of banding yeah. together and saying, we'll get through this. And it really impacted the culture. So we had to lay off the sales team, which is about, I don't know, four people. We had to take some people and try to make them into game people, mm. you know? And um, because we were just like, it, the writing was just on the wall and we're like, well, I guess we, 
we, we know Facebook. We have like almost a hundred years of experience on Facebook with this right. team. Um, you know, there was like, there were great games on there that were casual, but they weren't like what we call mid core or, um, our CEO was a huge gamer and he's always like, I really wish there was this particular game for me. We leveraged a lot of things we learned about interest space and community yeah. within our chats. Um, and really social gaming was like a, a bigger thing. And so there was a lot of, com our games were a little different. They were more competition based. There were, call them like closer to settlers of Catan yeah. like through your resources. And then you build your little fiefdom and then you go to war or you make treaties. So it was just this epic game where you just continuously, and it's so funny because we didn't even have like, well, we were, we we're cash constrained. So we had a lot of art interns come in, art school students were like, Hey, can you help yeah. us out? Here? And Holly, <laughs> take me to you mentally, right? In that moment, did you ever have those moments where maybe it's even like that Asian background of saying, I need to have a secure job and make money. And like, is this the right choice for me? Did you have that where you're like, am I, am I in the right position or it did it never waver? Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny when we were smaller, that was the thing us founders would always say, especially early on when we were like thinking about returning the money, that was really sad and nothing, no, like nothing was gaining traction. Like I never wanted to talk to anybody about the company because it was just too embarrassing for me. Wow. I was like, we're not even succeeding. Um, and so we never really talked a lot about it, but we also talked about, well, I guess we'll have to go try to find Silicon Valley jobs somewhere. Yeah. You were I thinking think of like the next out. thing, and right? That's yeah, but that's a very blessed place to also be in where I'm like, okay, I have that safety net of like, maybe I can go as it, as it got bigger, it, it certainly felt, um, in some ways more lonely too, because, um, the org starts growing bigger. You don't, you lose out on a lot of the beginning project feel, which is super fun. And you're just in a room and you feel like the rebels because you're like, I left my stick it to the man job and now here yeah. I am. So so one time we acquired a company and they they said something on the call. They're like, yeah, we just want to make sure the mothership was happy. And I looked around and go, oh, crap, we're the mothership now. Right. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. What had happened and here? And part of that yeah, growth so that I'm always curious about is scaling culture, right? It becomes naturally, it becomes much harder to really yeah. create a great culture as you scale, not only, you know, within the U S but then you went global and you have an office in China and whatnot. So one mm. thing I read, by the way, in founder musings and anyone listening, if you're a founder, like I actually think it's so valuable and I wish you were still writing them. But anyway, you write these essays. <laughs> That's good yes. encouragement. <laughs> but anyway, Holly, you wrote something there that stuck out to me, which was like, likes, like, you know, and almost hiring, yeah. making sure that you have similar values. I wanted you to talk a little bit about scaling culture in that lens, but also how do you ensure you also have diversity of thought? Yeah. So it's kind of interesting because you want, you want similarity enough to be aligned and then you want diversity to be able to like, kind of be able to fly out there and, because innovation is always like the hardest thing uh, for anything, especially if everybody thinks alike, it's right. really hard. Um, so as I mentioned, our whole founding team is Chinese American. Um, and so it, it's interesting that we absolutely attracted a lot of Asians. Uh, about 25% of our company employees were women. I'm 25, 25 uh, yeah. of the founding team is Incredible. women. So it's just kind of interesting how it does kind of templatize. And initially, it's partly because you recruit from your networks, right? We have a lot of relatives that initially worked for us because we just didn't have enough, like, um, you know, you're not going to pay a recruiter. Like, it just gets harder. So, but then it also gets harder to recruit from your own tapped whales. So you have to go out a little bit further, right? You have to start creating systems to where the other people become recruiters and you put those systems in, or you have to have those people recruit folks that are, are like, not are like, not like us, but mm -hmm. like them, you know, and you always have to kind of take that bet of like, okay, they're a little bit different for me in this way. Um, but in terms of values, I certainly think that that's incredibly important where I think you have to be aligned on your values. Cause if you're not, then it just gets really, really hard yeah. to just do business or, or you start, you start, the employee themselves start like, I don't know, did I choose the right place? The other one where if you're just not, if you just don't believe in the strategy or where it's going, that's the other reason right. why 
folks do end up going um, on those two. So the interesting thing about um, scaling culture, and I, I was on the team of like helping to write values like constantly from the beginning, um, is it really, and somebody pointed this out later, it was actually all the same values. And we had to actually update our values. We updated them like three yeah. times to almost scale with the org. So the first, the first spot, everybody has read the Netflix culture. And I'm, I'm super impressed that that culture book has been able to be like judgment. And that's like a whole paragraph of what that means, right? Um, and we try to have something like that too. Leadership, this is what it means. Humility. Right. Um, and then, and then, so it was just one word, but it was the clip that we were like hiring folks at and just trying to explain these big paragraphs is really, really difficult. Um, you obviously, once you do performance reviews, you have to put it in there and you have to manage to those like yeah. values, right? Cause if it manages to that, and then obviously the goals have to be set in terms of that, like everything's kind of there. But then, um, as we grew bigger, probably around 500, 600, we're like, this is just getting really hard to like, oh, and one that here's a great value that never scales very well. Transparency. Mm. A lot of people are like, I'm going to be totally transparent. Here's my calendar. Here's this. And you know what? Everybody thinks about transparency because you don't have enough time to tell about like context is they're going to be like, oh, transparency means I have a say. I have a say in where we move to. I have a say right. in this. Like you're not being transparent because you didn't tell me like involve me in this strategy meeting or you're not showing me your calendar and it just gets information overload. And that's what they think transparency yeah. is. But it's like, it, it's, it's a little bit of underneath that. It's like needing to have integrity. Uh, and that's underlying that is humility. And so we had this one that was, we definitely had to ditch transparency and make it into integrity. Mm. It turned into humility. But what we ended up doing was uh, the first one was just words. And then the second version was, almost declaratives. It was like, start with customer loyalty, think and act like an owner. <laughs> like, um, success is never right. final, like super <laughs> like, boom, you know, that's our Asian-ness. Success is never yeah. final. Why not A plus, right? Um, and then by the time we were probably about a thousand employees, there was a lot of, you know, the other one that doesn't scale very well is get shit mm. done. Because you just end up with a lot of shit, right? It's just, excuse my language. No, on that's fine. You might no. have to get a note to that. But like, you just get like, it was just kind of aggro, not aggro, but just a lot of energy yeah. there. Um, and so things moved to things like make it happen. And then from make it happen, it was, it turned into we statements. So the last version really reflects a lot more like we make games that mm -hmm. will last forever. Um, we got each other's backs. Yeah. You know? um, so much more we statements. And it was really interesting. I should, I should try to dig wow. them out. But it was interesting. Or maybe that will be my next article. Yeah. Maybe I, I love the article it. on that one. I was like, maybe. I no, I mean, it, it's I also interesting because you, you share, like even beyond that, like, you know, the transitions of teams and scale as you get bigger. I know you have like the, the robo yeah. is synonym and analogy. Oh, yes. But like, I think yes, there's this totally true. similar thing, or at least something to build off of with values too. Because it's something that, at least I think yeah. a lot about. So I love that. And then Holly, I want to know, you know, now you've obviously had an incredible career in gaming. I want to know what your experience has been like as a woman in game, gaming, as a founder. Did you experience that, you know, like you said, going to pitch to investors? Yes, oh. the Asian co-founding team, but also being a woman. How has that experience <laughs> been for you? So that's interesting. Uh, we never went all together. It was just one. I think we just felt like there's always an Asian stereotype of wow. like, we're the Borg and like, it feels like we cluster the, the Asian mafia. So very sensitive. I'm very sensitive to that. Even to this wow. day of like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I think we're too Asian. <laughs> we got to diversify. And it does naturally, it is easier. It's funny because I grew up around like non-Asians and how a lot of my personal network is, yeah. is Asians. And I get it. There's a shortcut there from culture and some of the values and how you grew up, but it doesn't make the best stuff sometimes, right? Absolutely, it doesn't. Um, so you have to like, m like be very intentional about that. Um, I apologize. Can you repeat so the question? Being, so now even beyond Asian, being a woman, right? And the uh, only woman, 25% yeah, of the founding yeah, so team. The yeah, how that is that? It. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, it was lonely and wonderful at the same time. One of the things that I did not mention about culture is 
a hundred percent, the culture is not only set at the top, but it's also who you bring in the door. That's like not a hundred percent, but 98%. And we had amazing mm. folks that came worked at Kabam. We saw marriages. We saw, it was just such a special time. And I can't take much credit for like people that are just amazing. Um, but like at the same time, it was just such a great kind of like um, time in yeah. the market as well. Like a lot of things were easier. So I definitely think it's funny. I would have said early on that being a woman in, um, you know, I would have just said, I'm just a founder. Like Marissa Meyer would say this a lot. I'm just, I'm not a girl engineer. I'm just a nerd, just like everybody right. else. But what you don't realize is other people don't see you that way. And I think it's very, very important to realize that, that um, as much as I have this joke, I go, man, on the inside, I feel like a white male, but people keep treating me like an Asian female. I don't know what's wrong, right? Oh, and I love like, that. No matter how much I feel on the inside, absolutely there's impact to things on the outside. And it's particularly as we grew bigger, um, you only have little wisps. Like I would get judged on things that I had no context for them to get to know me on, right? Because it was so many employees, I'd be judged on like how, what I dressed, what I wore. There's even female founders who like AB, there was one female founder, she AB tested curly hair versus straight hair. And she's like, oh, straight hair works better, oh you know? And women unfortunately have to do that. It's no different, particularly in gaming. And sometimes it's just even worse, but it's, it's, it's all yeah. around. <laughs> the, the, the inequities all around and in every industry. Now, Holly, now that you've seen, now you're on the other side, right? And you've seen what it's like to be the investor. Do you have advice for female founders who are coming in and what, yeah, oh, what do you think? Yeah, so absolutely. So first, huge fan of any woman who wants to go on the investing side or the, or the founder side. We need more women on both sides of the table so that because there are certain problems that we have that need to get funded and there needs to be a lot more support around that. So I just want to say that kind of out, out there, I think, um, and there's been studies around this, around preventative questions and potential questions where you have to, where women tend to get asked preventative questions. So like, are you sure you could do this? And I hate to admit it, but I will admit it. I've done it before too. I remember this one woman she was coming, she, she's like, Holly, I want you on my cap table. I'm doing a gaming company. There's this, this, and this. And I was like, but have you live opt a game before? Because, you know, these people, this position in my team didn't, like, do you know the number? And she was like, finally, she's like, Holly, why don't you believe me? And I just, I just stopped dead in my tracks. I was like, yeah, what is going on with you, Holly? Like, you're buying into, because all I see are, yeah. this is how women are getting treated. And this is how I should treat. And some female founders will come and tell me, they're like, I get treated worse from women than I do men. And men themselves get judged, obviously, off of potential. They've even seen this with performance reviews. I've even had it at my own wow. company where I get judged for certain things. And I'm like, really? OK, OK, like I'll change the way I dress and look. But I really realize it just doesn't change while yeah. they, they think about you kind of thing. So I, I think so. But the other things also, and this is this is for actually a lot of a lot of not just women, but, um, you know, pitch the entire market. Don't just pitch like if we get 10 percent of this, men tend to just go for the whole kit and caboodle because investors will do kind of like a haircut anyways. Right. So it's OK. <laughs> I also think, uh, yeah, women do tend to be a bit more cautious, but they absolutely overperform. Yeah in so many ways, right? They tend to be the most profitable. And I don't know if they even choose to be profitable because they're like, I think Katrina Lake once said, she's like, oh, I didn't choose to be profitable. I had to be because nobody wanted to give me any any money. It's so, right? yeah. Um, and so it's really painful. No, and I'm glad you brought that up even from your own experience on the, you know, not on the receiving end of saying like, it got up to me too, right? And just like recognizing that because I think it's almost that self-fulfilling prophecy that feeds into others and how you're sharing with others in a sense. So oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy you said oh, that. Absolutely. Okay, Holly, before we go on to the more fun <laughs> questions, I do want to ask- Oh, the fun I questions. I do want to ask, you ultimately <laughs> sold Kabam for over a billion dollars. Just talk me a little bit through that. How was that experience for you? Yeah. So I, I have to hand it up to a lot of the other execs who are on the team. I mean, that and in particular our CEO, like uh, amazing amount of work done by the presidents and them. Like I, 
I was much more probably support in many ways. Um, I was definitely in China helping to initially kick off some things. And then I'm like, it, but I can't even think that I could take even an infinite, like the amount that they had put in and the amount of work that they had pushed. And don't get me wrong, it takes all the employees just to even get it to the point of making it that valuable of too. Right. Um, so by the time, if you have a company and you're so, and you're lucky enough or blessed enough to get to the point where we were, there really is like um, a couple of things. One, there's only a subset of buyers who have enough cash to buy you. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing. Two, they always say great companies are never sold. They're, they're never bought yeah. or sold. Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah. So basically it's very hard to say, please buy me, please buy me, please buy me. It's much better if it's the other way around. So it's almost like a fundraising process, but very, very particular. Interesting. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's for the, it's usually like strategic value that they want you eventually. So eventually what um, the CFO and our CEO did and the exec team did that was pretty, made a lot of sense was they call it a pro forma, like, and you see this a lot, pro forma, pro forma financials, pro forma cap table. And it's like a version of what the financials look like for a particular game, a particular business unit. So the greatest thing about game studios is you can have a lot of studios and it's the same business mm -hmm. model. So they could roll up, they could be their own p &L, they could roll up. One of our largest games was Marvel Contest of Champions. It was Street Fighter, but with Marvel characters. That game was built by 70 people in Vancouver. It was grossing almost $400 million a year. 70 people, Crazy. right? So if you cut out all the rest of us, the R&D, and don't get me wrong, um, other other game teams absolutely floated the rest of the company for a while. China was killing it yeah. on our, our mobile game, right? And they were, they were floating the rest of it. But um, if you think about it, we're like, okay, from, from that lens, our, our EBITDA and our profitability look really great. And that's when NetMarble bought that, spun out the rest of the companies or rest of the divisions into kind of its own parts and created a, something called Aftershock. Mm. So a lot of things, unfortunately, got split for parts. Um, Aftershock, you know, what's really funny is um, our LA office became, it, they were building this one. It was a really fun game called Marvel Strike First. It's still there. Um, that one got sold to Fox Next, which I think got bought by Disney, which got sold to Scope. Wow. Like, it's just yeah. kind of funny to see where all, we call them Kabammers, Kabam alumni that. are at. And it, um, we have a big game conference called GDC. So it's always yeah. fun to run into them and see where they're at in the industry. But yeah, I mean, I think um, the, it, it's like such a huge team effort um, on, on doing, on, you know, even, even the person who's pushing the art to make sure that like there's enough content to make sure that you know, the customer has something that they can find a value there and Incredible. maybe increase the revenue. Like yeah. There's there's just so many things that are involved. So, uh, so yeah, that's pretty much how it, it, it was a bit Inc parted and added up together. I love it. I love it. Okay. Holly, one is, what is a book yes. you would recommend for everyone to read? <laughs> this might be controversial, but I would say the Bible. Oh, okay. It has so many interesting characters yeah. about humanity great proverbs in there all the way to just a lot of lessons yeah, I'm just in it surprised how much no that's great a lot of lessons and how much people like i was like oh my god this yeah is right here it's i love crazy. it so i'd have okay it. what are the best was it best selling books too? yeah no for sure okay, and popular. okay holly what is a craft that you are spending your lifetime honing I think the craft like after having this conversation with you that i've been spending my lifetime doing is being like trying to be open, yeah. like just open. Okay. Like I was like, Oh yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I think it's a hard thing to do because I get super crotchety and super nimby and I'm like, man, if I could just yeah. be open. Yeah. Okay. A lot of things I love happen. it. Holly, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. She leads. You're the best. This is great. Of course. Bye. <laughs>